Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. It's The In Show, Australia's only show dedicated to innovation from Adelaide, Australia and across the globe. Hi, this is David Grice and Troy Simcock. Now, this show is all about innovators and entrepreneurs, startups, people with great ideas who really are looking at, you know, a way of changing our lives for the better, making things more efficient, more effective, and they're putting everything on the line to do it. It's pretty inspiring stuff. It really is. And the difference these people are making to the way we live our lives is just unbelievable. You know, you think about where we were 10 years ago in comparison to where we are right now. Mm. It is absolutely amazing where we've gone. Isn't it funny because some of these ideas come up and you often think, like, did we really need that? I mean, like, you know, as humans, couldn't we just, you know, get up and turn the TV on and off ourselves rather than needing the remote? I mean, if you take a look at how that has changed people's lives... And now, you know, for me, things like that come up all the time. And I'm like, do we really need that? But what you realise is when that's taken care of, then all these other things show up that you didn't see. And, you know, it's really making us be so much more efficient than we were in the past so we can concentrate on those things that matter most. Well, the thing is, there's so many arguments over the remote control in in my household. (laughs) Like, you know, who who actually holds it? It's usually the child that holds the key there. But, uh, you know, like, it's just amazing how we're... You know, years ago, we would have thought of these things as something so far-fetched and so really weird, but now they're things that we can't live without. Mm, Exactly. Star Trek is real life these days. (laughs) It sure is. Now, you can subscribe to the intro at OzCastNetwork.com. Just hit the subscribe button to choose your preferred platform. We've got a big show ahead of us. We certainly do. Now, we're actually going into the world of the Rotary Clubs. Now, they're part of an international network of business professionals and community leaders who strive to make the world a better place through practical efforts. But you might not know that the Rotary Club of Adelaide particularly has an innovation group. And we're going to find out about their work with Hands On Project, which are making artificial hands for victims of war and landmines. And we're also speaking with Scott Rogash from the Forage Supply Company, who are creating a movement of people helping themselves and the world around them. They're on a mission to show you simple ways where you can contribute to the environment and bring sustainability to your life. It was more just a, yeah, I guess a big passion I saw and a lot of our ideas and thoughts come from overseas and, yeah, different countries and how they do it and even just through the food we eat. A lot of countries in Southeast Asia and Europe, it's sort of lots of fruit and veg and small amounts of sustainable meat. So, you know, it's sort of instead of meat and veg, veg and meat, mm. where I feel Australia's, a bit, you know, we're very much big, got to eat the big steaks and a little bit of veg. If we might have had a bit more understanding on the impact it's having on the environment, we might be able to start changing our ways a little bit. More from Forage Supply Company a little bit later, but now here's Claire with more in news, including a story about how human skills, not technology, will be increasingly valuable for the innovators of the future. Thanks, guys. This week I'll be talking about machines that can harvest water from the air, but first... Motor vehicle company Ford has designed hangover-inducing suits. They've been created in a bid to raise awareness around the effects drinking alcohol can have on your body the next day. To help people understand the effects, Ford designed a suit that mimics the symptoms of a hangover. It's fitted with a pair of headphones that play extremely loud music to imitate a headache, a set of goggles that makes the user's eyes sensitive to light and makes their vision blurry, heavy cuffs connected to the arms and legs simulate slow movements, and a weight attached to the chest area to create a sense of lethargy. Not much research has been conducted into how a hangover affects your driving ability, so this seems like a great step towards finding out more and raising awareness. Five companies who think they can harvest water from the air have been shortlisted to win the Water Abundance X Prize. The main aim of the competition is to create contraptions that could potentially replace desalination plants, which create CO2 emissions that harm the climate. This year's participants had to create devices that could extract at least 2,000 litres of water a day from the air. The total cost of the equipment used and predicted maintenance expenses for 10 years had to be under $146,000. The contraptions also had to be powered by renewable energy. The companies, including Australia's Hydro Harvest, have innovated in all sorts of ways, from a solar-powered water condensing box that can collect water at night and heat, condense and release it during the day, to a solar-powered water condenser that adds essential minerals that can be attached to roofs and other surfaces, and a wind turbine that can power a water generator compressor. The winner of the competition will be decided in July. 
And with advancing AI technology, some investors believe we should be teaching kids to be creative rather than how to code. At this point, it's almost inevitable that machine learning capabilities will advance to the point where software can code quicker and better than humans. Currently, machines and computers are intelligent, have huge memory capacities and can process commands at an insane speed. But education systems around the world are still recommending that kids learn STEM subjects like coding if they want to be a successful entrepreneur. So it's been suggested that schools should be teaching kids to be empathetic, imaginative and creative. Creativity and out-of-the-box thinkers will become highly sought after in the future. Some think kids should be taught the necessary skills to get careers as inventors, artists and caregivers. This is because these roles are much harder to program or computerise, whereas other jobs that are repetitious have a higher chance of being automated. As we become more reliant on technology, we can't forget the importance of creativity. And that's what's in news this week. Thanks, Claire. Well, David, that's really been something that's come up. When we started doing the intro, we thought, you know, it was all about technology, but it is very clear that the human skills are going to be the things that really make a difference. After all, someone's got to come up with the idea in the first place. Yes, and creativity plays such a part in this. And uh, I'm all for teaching kids the art of being creative and, and just letting their imaginations run wild. And there are so many brilliant people that are capable of creating code and those sorts of things. But I kind of agree with this article in in the sense that machines will get very, very good and very, very fast at doing this sort of thing. So if we can continue to keep these creative skills in in kids emerging and bubbling up, then surely that's going to stand us in much better stead in the future. Mm, You know, particularly when you think about caregivers and that kind of thing, it's really the human touch that has you as a vulnerable human you know, just feel you know, safe and secure. You know, how a robot will ever be able to do those things is beyond me. Yeah, and I look, I completely agree. And, and, you know, I've actually made a conscious effort in my life to not to minimise the amount of text messages I send, but to change the way that I send them and ensure that they're always backed up with some personal, you know, one-on-one contact because without that, the context of words on a screen uh, can be taken in so many different ways. Mm. And and I think that one of the things that, I don't know, probably everybody on the planet has, has been victim of is somebody sending you a message that's in capital letters. Now, for me, when I used to text, you know, when I first started texting, I'd text in capital letters <laughs> simply because it was easier to do that than do it in lower and upper case. You're a very angry man back then too, weren't you? <laughs> well, no, never. <laughs> but but I think what, what I'm getting at there is that people can misconstrue a text or a, or a text-based message in a completely different way than actually what the intent is. Mm. And I think this whole manner of communication via human efforts is, is to me, it's, it just can't disappear. Mm. It's going to be really interesting to see what the future holds. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock talking innovation on The In Show. You can check us out at theinshow.online, Facebook, and follow The In Show on Twitter. You know, I'm really enjoying doing podcasts. As a radio guy, I n- never thought I'd do anything different. But this, you know, opportunity to sit down and have a really meaningful conversation has proven to be so valuable. Well, look, as a non-radio guy, you know, the fact that I'm able to uh, to communicate in this way for me is just absolutely incredible as well. It's extraordinary that, you know, finding something you're really passionate about and, you know, just having a, an engaging discussion about that, how far that that can reach. I mean, I don't think we expected the results we've received on the intro. Well, to be honest, I, I had no idea that we were ever going to be speaking to the calibre of people that we, we are speaking to. And uh, I'm just loving hearing their stories and being able to then communicate those stories in a, in a meaningful way that enables people to not only find out about their product or their service, but about the journey that they've taken to get their product and their service. What's most important is that people's stories are heard. And what we're discovering through on-demand audio and podcasts is a really effective way to get to people that perhaps might have been difficult to get to previously. You think of a company where calling a staff meeting with all staff is actually impractical. Well, given the technology and way things are going right now, you know, you've got companies that have people in all corners of the globe, different time zones trying to communicate with each other. Mm. 
Yeah, the great thing about, you know, on-demand audio or any type of audio communication is that it's just delivering this concise message that is not misconstrued in any any way. It's, it's always delivered in the way it was intended. And what's great about on-demand audio and podcasting is people can be doing other things while they're absorbing it. For example, you know, you can be in the car or on the train or on the bus on the way to work and instead of listening to, you know, the drivel that might otherwise be out there or, you know, endless music, you can actually participate in a constructive conversation and find your life enriched as a result of that communication. Now, David, you and I, that's what we do with our lives these days. That's exactly right. And we'd love to help you. If you've got a, a business or you, you know, you're wanting to deliver a message to a different audience that you, you don't already have, we would love to be able to help you in any way, shape or form. Just email david at theinshow.online or troy at theinshow.online. No matter where you are in the world, we'd be happy to help you with your communications with on-demand audio and podcasts. Rotary Clubs are part of an international network of business, professional and community leaders who strive to make the world a better place through practical efforts. But you might not know, the Rotary Club of Adelaide has an innovation group. Recently, Rotarians, Rotary actors and their friends spent the morning making artificial hands for victims of war and landmines as part of Hands On Project. Daniel Cliff, Director of Youth Services for the Rotary Club of Adelaide and his fiancée, Elizabeth Beltrami, is the convener of the innovation group. So, guys, what's the purpose of this group? The innovation group is designed to be a flexible space for younger people within the Rotary Club of Adelaide to create projects that are innovative and focus on our passions and what we enjoy doing in our club. So when you um, speak about innovation, you know, what can that include? Is there particular areas you're looking at? It can kind of be anything that people within our innovation group are interested in, but at the moment we're focusing on younger people because we recognise that that's their strength. And then also we're focusing on helping people overseas through our hands-on project as well. What draws you to the projects that you're beginning to do with this? I mean, it's obviously this one with making hands for people is just so incredible. Like, and I can't wait to dig into that. But what made you actually go down that path in the first place? Uh, so I suppose Rotary already runs some fantastic projects as it is. And in this case, for the one that really stood out to us was a hands-on project because of the idea of having something tangible. And we came together as a group and essentially came with a small bag and ultimately in pieces. And then by the end of this two hours, we'd assembled a fully functioning prosthetic hand. Ultimately, that would go to victims of a landmine explosion in Southeast Asia. And we'll actually receive a photo back of how that's impacted that person's life. But building on the innovation part, I suppose what we're trying to achieve is take something in Rotary that is already working and working quite well, but try to take it a little bit further. The long-term plan is to ultimately go into corporate Adelaide and work with businesses that are, have budgets for corporate responsibility, I suppose you'd call it, and also getting young people involved in the community. And then hopefully we can connect with them and ultimately facilitate this project ourselves. So really what you're doing is sort of marrying the, the mindfulness that Rotary Clubs already have with the desire for bigger business to get involved, but they might not quite know how to step into it or they don't know, you know what projects are worthwhile. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And I see that there is a bigger push on corporate social responsibility for businesses to get involved in and this is kind of a pathway for them to become involved in something that will make such a meaningful difference to someone's life overseas. And they can do it. The hands-on project only took us two two hours to do on a Saturday morning. So it's a way for you to make a real difference in a couple of hours. So that's one of the really big draw factors of why we chose this project to start with. As well, what I find is with young people in the digital age, they're very connected and they actually do care a lot about their broader community. But often they're not so sure how I can contribute. So I suppose it's really fantastic for us if we can get this going that we can build that connection to community a bit more and ultimately people that really do want to make the world a better place have the opportunity to do that. And if their first experience is overwhelmingly positive like mine was with Rotary through their youth camps, then that will create a bit of momentum to get more people involved and Mm. through word of mouth hopefully we can create something really big. So how many people have you got involved in the project so far? Within our innovation group, we've got a core group of about 15 to 20 people and then we also have the support of the Rotary Club of Adelaide which is a lot bigger than that and so I think the Rotary Club of Adelaide is the biggest in South Australia so we've got the broader support of them and then our core group of members of 15 to 20 helping out. So tell us about Hands On Project. So the Hands On Project is an existing Rotary Rorks project so that's a Rotary Australia project that 
has been happening for quite a number of years. And you buy 10 hands, a set of 10 hands, that's $5,000. And on a morning like we did last Saturday, a facilitator comes along and helps and guides you to build those hands. They are then sent overseas and fitted with a team of Rotarians or volunteers to victims quite often of landmines. And the countries that so far where the hands have gone to have been Sri Lanka, Laos and Cambodia. And so they normally do one to two trips a year. So they've got one coming up to Sri Lanka later on this year. Mm. I really love uh, what you've got going on here. It seems to me that there's, you know, two things happening. There's, you know, people get to be involved in an innovation group because they care about things and, and want to be a contribution, but it also exposes them to being involved in innovation and creating something from nothing. So is the thought being that if this is a pre-existing project that it might start getting people's creative juices going and you might see another opportunity to take something from nothing that could really impact the rest of the world. Definitely. And that's how we've seen that the hands-on project has existed for quite a number of years. And then us being able to take it into potentially the corporate sector is where we see that we're being innovative with how it's being run. So we'll help facilitate in the future team building type activities in the corporate sector to kind of expose this Rotary project to a broader community and also hopefully interest some corporate members to become involved in Rotary if they had not previously. I can really see how this would be amazing for a corporate organisation as a team building exercise because the value that they would get as individuals working together on something so significant, but then the difference that they can see Mm. then in the life of somebody that they've created this hand for would be Mm. absolutely extraordinary. Are you finding that that's something that you guys are looking towards trying to push forward with? Fortunately, with the Rotary Club of Adelaide being one of the largest ones within Adelaide, it also means there's people that are quite connected within Adelaide and that means that ultimately we already have a number of places we're looking to implement this. I suppose we're still at that stage where only last Saturday we actually learned how to assemble these hands ourselves. So now we're at the stage as a facilitator, then it's up to people who want to be involved with that. My background is education, so then it makes sense that I would love to be involved to run these various corporate entities. However, I'm sure others would like to be involved with that too. The team building experience that we had last Saturday when we built them ourselves was so amazing and to actually do it ourselves and see when you're literally creating a hand out of a number of pieces and by the end of two hours you can see how this hand will make a difference in someone's life was so inspiring and really helped push along the project that we've been planning for the last six months. So I really can see how it would be such a great team building experience for any team in the corporate sector, the community any team would really benefit from mm. these hands. I'd also just like to add that I'm probably on the younger side of many Rotarians at the tender age of 26, but I found that when I went through the RILA programs, that's Rotary Youth Leadership Awards week-long intensive youth camp, I found it really helped me find some innate leadership qualities, I suppose. As we alluded to, it's only two hours of our time, but I found that what we started about 9am and then it was an intensive workshop of about two hours or so and we'd assembled this hand and I just found that dopamine rush, that good feeling, just happy of I've done something good in the world, lasted the entire weekend. Then you take some a really positive mindset into Monday and just to build that momentum and have that as an experience has been fantastic. And we also did a similar thing where a common project the Rotary Club of Adelaide does is selling the wood chopped at the Adelaide show. Mm-hmm. So that's a simple one. And my background as a PE teacher, I could contribute a lot to this because I was in quite good shape. Mm-hmm. So simply it was people coming along getting cheap firewood and that goes towards another cause. And it just, once again, if that's how you start your weekend from 8 to 10, it leaves a really, really good impression. Mm. And then ultimately you take some really positive feelings into the next day, the next week, and so on and so forth. There really is something in that, I think, for other startups and entrepreneurs to learn from because often, you know, the thing can be the amazing idea is created and then it's like, how do we do it? And even if you can assemble the people to physically do it, then there's having to raise the capital to get it done. Um, And there really is something in what you guys have built in terms of like a a strong network of people who seem to be almost, you know, being able to be trusted that if – an idea comes from Rotary that you can probably find some support somewhere if you reach out. Whereas like a, a startup is literally like pitching an idea and kind of hoping that someone will find the meaningfulness in it. Can you see the model that you have somehow benefiting startups and entrepreneurs outside of Rotary clubs? 
Yes, I think that one of the things that I've noticed from being part of the Rotary Club of Adelaide's team is that it is essentially a big team where you don't feel alone in bringing your ideas and building on them. And that has been so beneficial and we've seen that our projects have really taken off because the support and the expertise of people in other areas that I'm not an expertise in have really meant that they can take off. And so for someone who was an entrepreneur or or building a startup company, if they have an idea like that and it's linked to the community in some way, involving your local Rotary Club is something that definitely is an avenue to help get more support for that idea. Rotary is not probably an organisation that you would choose to jump in on because it's not really, I mean, for me, it hasn't been something that's been front and centre in in my thinking. Mm -hmm. What made you guys get involved with Rotary? Daniel and I both got involved with Rotary from similar pathways. Rotary is really involved in youth and youth development. That's a key area of focus that they have. And so we were both involved in a RILA camp, which stands for Rotary Youth Leadership Award, which is, yes, an intensive one-week program where you don't have a phone, you're with a group of strangers and you're really pushed to extend yourself. And it was through that, I know for myself and possibly for Daniel as well, I had grown so much as a person from that seven-day program that I owed it to the program to keep going and give back to it the next year. And that kind of grew in me in that realising the world is so much bigger than just myself. I want to give back to my community because I'm able to and I have the capacity to. Although Daniel and I are quite young for the average Rotarian age, because it helped so much in so many youth around the world that it was a really nice pathway for us. I found that I had leadership qualities in some avenues in my life prior to going to this program, but that was things like in a sporting sense, but I hadn't had chance to develop my skills in terms of public speaking, there's other seminars like conflict resolution, so on and so forth, and some really good life skills that ultimately, unfortunately, our education system seems to miss. And just ultimately I felt that I was able to better understand myself at the end of this program, but also has formed some really strong bonds with people from many corners of the globe. And when you're a young 18-year-old that doesn't quite understand the world, just hearing some of the stories of these young refugees and where they've come from. So just to give context without giving too much away of the program, one of the things we do is timelines. So it's a mix of professional speakers coming along and team leaders running programs. This one's run by team leaders. And we've got a small group as they mentor them through the program. But just by about day two, they're actually giving a small snapshot of your life and often I found myself in a position where I was telling things quite personal that probably my best friends didn't know about me at the time because I felt very comfortable in that space and they did a lot to really make that and just being able to hear some really inspiring stories of how people from war-torn countries essentially had got to where they had really gave perspective on life and then ultimately motivated you to be around like-minded people the fact that they were able to come that trauma and still do some really good things in the world obviously brought you up to do some good as well. Mm-hmm. And Rotary provides these RILA programs all around Australia and internationally as well. So we're lucky that we were able to experience it in South Australia, but they do exist across the world as well. And that's one way that they help to build youth in the community and help develop them. And it is fully funded. So Mm. often the model will be that, for example, we're in District 9500, which is part of South Australia. There's two districts in South Australia, essentially. And it would be that, say, the Rotary Club of Gawler Light, for example, would sponsor someone from their local region generally and pay the full expenses for that person and then in return they would come back and speak at their program and say this is what I got out of it so Mm -hmm. Rotary is very committed to the youth and they're recognizing that if they don't put a lot of attention into it then there'll be a gap in -hmm. the future. I think what we're hearing here is that there is this very strong network that exists not only in Australia but right around the world what's the connectivity of Rotary in Adelaide like globally? I found it be quite connected, but I'm not so sure it's Adelaide specific, more that it's just Rotary specific. So I, Elizabeth went on this program too. I went to the Ryla North America. So that was a... A similar program run overseas, but internationally. Yeah. So we've gone um, from about 40 awardees to 200 now. And there were two Australians. I was one of them when I went. Mm-hmm. And this time we'd probably covered a greater coverage of the globe mm-hmm. in terms of awardees. And ultimately I found that the generosity of people was overwhelming and never had that level of kindness to otherwise strangers. Mm. So we had met these people for about three or four days and then ultimately I was travelling around North America just for some time afterwards because it's a long way to get there. Mm. So I thought I'd enjoy myself while I'm there and I found that I actually changed my travels because people just opened their doors and said, you can come stay with me, I'll show you around my city. And we just 
overwhelmed by the kindness simply because all we shared was a Rotarian. It comes down to four-way tests, they call it. It's really four key values and the fundamental theme is having integrity and being a good human. Mm. So, you know, if people are hearing, you know, how connected Rotary is and that you're now working in the innovation space, if somebody had an innovation that they wanted to get off the ground, how would that work? You know, can they literally become a member and, you know, put an idea in front of you or is there, you know, is there more formalities than that? If someone had an idea that was innovative and involved the community and would make the community develop or improve it in any way, definitely get in contact with your local Rotary Club. You would be surprised that there are a lot around the world. I didn't probably realise how many Rotary Clubs there were before I was actually in it, but there are so many. And get involved with them because they're always a group of people that the common theme is that you want to help your community and serve your community above yourself is the key theme. But sometimes people don't have the ideas themselves. So if you have the idea, take it to them. And I know certainly in the past and even now, I would be happy to hear from any innovative projects that are out there that can help the community. So what's next? You know, we're, we're building hands. What do you see as the, the next project you guys are interested in getting your teeth into? So maybe not project specific, but we really want to try to build more momentum so we can be a bit more of a pilot for a really successful club that's doing a lot to capture that audience from about 18 to 40 because often we find that's one where people are in a really busy stage of their life. Of course, people older than that are still very busy as well. But when you factor in young professionals, potentially children, it can be really hard to have that outlet and that's why we aim to be flexible first of all to cater to them. So we really want to try to build momentum both in numbers of our current innovation group and then really try to have some sort of retention rate for demonstrating success of this project in the corporate sector. And we also have found that within our group, like I mentioned before, working with youth is something that is a strength of all of our members in different capacities. So we want to build on that strength and instead of recreating the wheel of building another water well overseas, which is an amazing project that does happen in Rotary, but that's not necessarily a strength that we have. So we want to work with youth. And so we're planning a few projects later on in the year that where we want to build professional development for youth to help engage them with what we're doing in our club at the moment as well. And we also just see some opportunities for better engagement between the different clubs. So I, as an educator, I'm starting an Interact Club in my current school. Interact is essentially a Rotary-based organisation for within high school. school students. Yeah, mm-hmm. within a school. And then there's Rotaract, as we've discussed, so 18 to 30-year-olds. And Elizabeth was instrumental in getting that going in South Australia. And we want to see some more connectivity between the two. So my current role for next Rotary year, which match financial years, will be youth director at the Rotary Club of Adelaide. And I see opportunity to just with some really good strategic planning and execution, opportunities to have some more connectivity within, I'm thinking, high school students to uh, university students and especially there's already an Interact Club going at Adelaide High School. has been going for about 20 years but with Adelaide Botanic High opening next year. I see an opportunity there and they're in close proximity of Adelaide Oval where we meet for our luncheon meetings and I see a really good opportunity for even just mentoring from university students and then connecting Rotary actors to Rotarians who are already in the industry and having successful careers so everyone can get something out of it. Mm. That's fantastic. Well, guys, congratulations on the Innovation Group and uh, Daniel and Elizabeth from the Rotary Club of Adelaide, thanks so much for joining us on the In Show. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. To find out more about the Hands On Project, visit handsonproject.com.au or rotaryaustralia.org.au. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock on the In Show. Next, we hear about how an Aussie Rules footballer is collaborating with a seasoned traveller to teach us how we can do our bit to preserve the environment and be effortlessly sustainable. Download the Phoner app before you head to your next event. Find people easier, market yourself better and get connected using Phoner. That's spelled P-F-O-N-R. Phoner. Available in the App Store now. Hi, I'm Dan Thorson from Mighty Kingdom and you're listening to The In Show. 
It's David Grice and Troy Sincock on The In Show. Visit OzcastNetwork.com and subscribe to The In Show on whatever platform you like. It could be Apple Podcasts, it could be Spotify, and of course you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. Scott Rogash and his mate Justin Westoff were born and raised in South Australia's Barossa Valley. Together, they've created Forage Supply Company, creating a movement of people helping themselves and the world around them. And they're on a mission to show you everyday things where you can contribute to the environment and bring sustainability to your life. Uh, Scott, it's not a regular thing to see an Aussie rules player champion the environment. What led you to work with Justin on this business? Me and Justin both grew up in the Brossa together, as you said there, and been lifelong mates, I guess. And yeah, we both had a uh, passion for, I guess it started off with the homelessness side. We've both been involved with the Hutt Street Centre for over 12 years now ourselves. I did it through my sports recreation and management degree, had to do a placement there. And then, yeah, Justin was just started his career, AFL career, and um, just jumped on board. I guess it's getting closer to the end of Justin's footy career and we were just chatting one day about starting a business up together and it was going to start off with just a wine company like because my parents own a bit of vineyard in the Brossa Valley. I've done a lot of travel and got a lot of passion for the environment and looking, you know, trying to work out more sustainable ways to live. And so, yeah, we sort of looked at the wine and started doing a bit more organic wine practices and, yeah, just stumbled across this little um, caravan and next minute we had a little food truck doing, yeah, fully sustainable food around the... Ross Valley in South Australia. Fantastic. So tell me, you know, when you talk about that you uh, developed a bit of a passion for the environment, what did that look like for you initially? Yeah, well, I guess the, the big point for me was when I was actually doing my dive masters in Honduras, I got to spend three months there diving and speaking to the locals and they were just explaining like what the corals was like 20 years ago and to what it is now. And it got to a point to like, we're really the problem here. And over a lot of travel through Europe, Southeast Asia, they're a lot more switched on, I guess, with the environment side and doing a lot more things, even recycling and all that. It's sort of built into their culture a bit more, I feel. And I've just found you come back to Australia and we didn't, I don't know if we have got the education on it or we're just not up to scratch with it. So I just wanted to bring a few things that I knew, learnt from over there and bring it back over here and just showcase different ways like to create a more sustainable future. So mm-hmm. it was more just a, yeah, I guess a big passion I saw and a lot of our ideas and thoughts come from overseas and, yeah, different countries and how they do it and even just through the food we eat. A lot of countries in Southeast Asia and Europe, it's sort of lots of fruit and veg and small amounts of sustainable meat. So, you know, it's sort of instead of meat and veg, veg and meat. Where I feel Australia's a bit, you know, we're very much big, got to eat the big steaks and a little bit of veg. If we might have had a bit more understanding on the impact it's having on the environment, we might be able to start changing our ways a little bit and not be extremists about it. But, you know, just being able to understand the impact it can have by just changing your diet a little bit or clothing or housing or recycling, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a diet. But, you know, there is simple ways that we can all start doing small changes and all of us together can make a big difference. So was the sort of portion sizes of meat and, and vegetables one of the key learnings that you had from what you saw overseas? Or were there other things that you saw that really changed the way you thought? Most likely the fruit and veg is the easiest way that I could find personally that I could make a big impact on the environment. And most probably didn't know how much resources the animal agriculture business uses. So I started doing a lot of study, reading researchers. And again, you know, the big thing is if you're just taking out the meats, can you get your protein, get your fibres? So I went, did a lot of interviews with plant-based doctors, did a lot of researches, read a lot of papers, a lot of case studies, and sort of found out that, yes, you know, we can still have a healthy, balanced diet. And whilst doing that, it's also going to be benefiting the environment a lot more. So it makes sense that from the ground to the plate back into the soil, it just made a lot of sense that it's, it can be a quite easy way without this big stereotype of, I guess, the word vegan, you know, we, we never use that word where we don't really like it. We're just saying, hey, here's a cool sustainable meal that if you like it, it's enjoyable, it's filling, you might be able to start substituting a bit of meat out or including it into your diet a little bit and, yeah, go from there. So how does the meat consume the resources? You, you talked about, you know, that it's very resource heavy creating, you know, the meat and that sort of thing. Yep. Can you tell us how that is? I actually had a phone call from Chris Darwin, who's Charles Darwin's great-great-grandson, and he's uh, just started an app called Meat Free or something, Um, and he did a bit of a study as well on sort of how much land you use, how much water you use, how much greenhouse gases. So the land you're using, you're using land to grow food for your cattle and that, so it's, you know, a lot of wheat, et cetera, for that. You're using a lot of water to water all that. Then you've got to feed the the land for the cows themselves, and then you've also got to water them as well, and then obviously the greenhouse gas emissions that they're using through methane and that. So I think we figured out 
one typical American hamburger to one of our meals, you save 519 litres of water, 2.24 square metres of land, and 1.134 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. Wow. So mm. since we've started, we've been able to save over 7 million litres of water, 347,000 square metres of land, and, you know, it's it just adds wow. up through... We've served over a thousand plant-based meals, so we're just saying everyone, even just eating with us, has been able to help this movement without really changing too much of their lifestyle either. Where mm. it's you know some simple little things that you can actually do. It seems to me that you know it's very much about you know connecting it to the individual and a person seeing a, a simple way that they can really contribute to the impact. Because it's not like humans don't want to assist other humans, but when it feels like you're contributing to something that's so much big, like a larger vision that you can't see how you're individually attached to it. It often comes up as, that sounds like a great idea, but uh, really, am I going to have any impact at all? You know, it's, it's very clear what you're already achieving. How do you have everyday Australians see that? 100%. Like, uh, so when I first started this, I'm still not fully plant-based myself. I just adopt a plant-based diet as much as I can. So when I cook, mm-hmm. I try to um, cook f- fully plant-based. Yep. But yeah, I did a social experiment where I went completely plant-based vegan for three months and saw the, you know, the troubles that you can have when you go to your local pub, you know, what do you have? Oh, well, we've got a, a veggie burger maybe. It will take the cheese off and it's just a plain veggie burger. And mm. so I thought, okay, well, I actually don't know how to cook plant. You know, I don't know myself how to actually do it. So what we wanted to do is, I guess, our target market is Gen Y, Gen Z. Mm-hmm actually educate the kids on how to grow something and then actually how to make something out of it directly, which will be filling, which will get you your proteins, your fibres and all that. And, yeah, I guess it's that education on actually how you can make a nice, tasty meal from it because it is still the ease. What, when you're shopping, you'll go chicken breast on special, let's go, spag bowls on special, my kids like it, it's easy. You can't argue it's been how we've been brought up. But mm. if there's ways that we can now start educating and showing them how to make these meals, you know, it's actually quite simple. So we can actually, our plan is to actually help educate people on how to make simple plant-based meals and show them how to start incorporating it. And if they can't do it, come and eat with us. We can show you the meals and we're more than happy to give you the recipes. We, we want kids to be learning to do it at home, want parents to have a muck around with them, have some fun with some veggie lasagnas or whatever whatever it really is you want to try. Mm. I really like that because, you know, you th- sort of think of if someone were to make a decision around, you know, look, I, I do want to make a contribution in that way and you buy a recipe book. I mean, the amount of times that I've done that, you see the picture, you go, I cannot wait to make this thing, it's going to be amazing. And then inevitably, like there's some ingredient or something that you don't know what it really is, it doesn't explain it or you don't know, you, you get what it is, but you have no idea where to find it and you find yourself running around to different places to find like one jar of whatever it is that you're looking for. And you, you get to a point where you kind of just give up and say that it's just not it's not working. That For people to be able to go, I want to be a contribution to this, and for you to sort of hold their hand through the process is extremely powerful. Very much. Nutritional yeast, when I started, I'd never, you know, it's it's a substitute sort of for your cheeses on your lasagna and that. Mm-hmm. You know, where do you find that? It's a, mm, yeah. you know, until you actually start looking, it's everywhere, but, you know, it's mm. a... I know it's just not something you'll normally have in your cupboard at home. Mm. So, you know, there is a lot of, it's just, yeah, trying to educate and then I've just got it at home all the time now, so it's there. But yeah. I love that, you know, this idea of, you know, Forage Supply Company has begun as almost like a, you know, a hospitality pursuit that has the environmental uh, benefits. You know, you've got the food truck, like you said, and, and that kind of thing. But you're now moving into areas like well beyond food. Can you tell us a bit about that? Me and Wesley have no experience in hospitality. We had no real interest in starting a food truck or anything. It was just more the easiest way that we could showcase your first small way of changing sustainability through diet. I guess through the growth of the business, I guess our mission statement has sort of gone the smallest impact on the environment, greatest impact on the community. And as I said before, our target market is Gen Y, Gen Z. So we nearly became more of an education and uh, showcasing ways to do it. So we've now gone into building school-based community gardens for the kids. So they are the guys that are going to make the change. That's mm. the demographic coming up that they understand the consequences that, you know, and sadly they are the ones that are going to deal with the consequences um, that we might yeah. leave behind. So yeah. I know, yeah, wesley has got three kids himself, so he, you know, he wanted to sort of showcase, you know, make sure they got to see the same, you know, rainforest and all that. Me, I've been, you know, lucky to see over 70 countries around the world, you know, do the Amazon Match Picchu, you know, down Africa. I've been lucky to see all these amazing places, but we do use a lot of those resources through food. So 
Yeah, it's uh, really become now to actually go into schools and we've got four gardens on the go now where we go in, we build the school base organic gardens with the kids. We then we teach them what's in season, how to grow something out of it. We bring in some ambassadors we've got with us. Uh, we've got a couple of guys that are fully plant-based and play cricket, a couple of wakeboarders that just, they've grown up on the river and want to, you know, just help. So we go in, we educate them. What are the kids' trigger points? You know, it's social media now, celebrities, bit of video. So we go and try and hit them with those sort of trigger points and sort of make it hipster to be environmentally adapt, I guess, or just thinking about the environment and doing some cool stuff where you can be making a difference. So definitely taken a bit of a turn. You know, we, we didn't know where it was going to take us. Mm. We literally had this idea and we just thought we'd let it grow organically. And now, yeah, we're sort of focusing now on the um, yeah a lot of the kids' sides as well. Mm-hmm. So tell us about your work with the homeless because that also that it involves a number of things, doesn't it? Does it involve the garden side of things as well as you know what you're about to do within building? Yeah, so we wanted to. I guess we sort of red flagged a little. I guess what the homeless were sort of eating. They're getting a lot mm-hmm. of processed meat for breakfast and lunch. Yeah. You know, just because that's what they were getting donated. So you know. The homeless shelters can only do what they're getting in. Mm. So we sort of had that healthy body, healthy mind. So we wanted to start donating plant-based meals to them so they could get the same chance to have a healthy, balanced diet, a five and two, a recommended dietary intake of fruit and veg that we all have. So since we've started, we've been able to donate 832 meals to homeless shelters across Mm -hmm. South Australia, with the big one being the Hutt Street Centre that we've been involved with now for 10 years, but also Ladder is Youth Homelessness in Port Adelaide, Mm -hmm. a couple around the Brossa Valley as well. So we wanted to give them the opportunity to have that healthy, balanced diet. But another thing we found too is a lot of the guys there didn't have any opportunity to get any work or to get anything to put on their resume. So a lot of guys have been very successful and just had a bad break up and, you know, lots of reasons why they've they've ended up on the street. And we sort of, again, being there for 10 years, we sort of, we see a lot of this, a lot of the guys coming in and out. So... When we first started with the van, we got the Royal Coke Club in the Fringe. was one of our first gigs. We needed clients, so me and Wes had just walked into the Hart Street Centre and we said, whoever wants to work, we'll give them some work. So the first mm. 15 people we hired were homeless wow. with no experience. Me and Westy had no experience, so Westy started football and I was left on the, with this little cow around in the fridge sort of <laughs> scratching my head for, um, <laughs> for a uh, yeah, fair while. But, you know... And the thing, I think out of those 15, two guys got jobs from that through um, having us as a referee and two of them got houses. Wow. So mm. we had already made an impact on a few people's lives just through giving them an opportunity. And we've got one lady that's still with us. She's been with us for 18 months now. We yeah, a couple now. And, you know, we just want to give them some skill sets and some opportunity to um, get in the workforce. And... Again, they're no different to you and me. I think it's something like we're all six weeks away from being homeless or something. So mm. a lot of them were very successful business people or women. And, yeah, they it just um, fall on a hard time. And, yeah, we just wanted to give them that second chance and, you know, be a little bit of their family. And we're a pretty relaxed sort of company. You know, we like to sort of have a bit of a laugh. But, you know, we want to get the job done right and we've got a product to deliver and we want to deliver it really well. But, yeah, we also put them through our interview process. We, you know, we make sure they do their, um, you know, fill out sort of contracts and get them in on super if they don't have it. We just kind of help them guide them through that and then ideally hopefully get them back into the community. Mm. What's so great is you've gone from, uh, you know, working with the homeless to actually being on the verge of building homes for people. Explain to me how that step is Yeah, happening. well, like, for each year, it, it is the, as I'll go back to our mission, it's the smallest impact on the environment, the greatest impact on the community. So... It was in any way that we could do it. And the sustainable building is something that we we're both very passionate about and most really long-term goal is where we wanted to end up. So, yeah, we're just about to launch another company called Box Factory, which builds modular sustainable housing and also puts the um, – we'll be able to put the homeless through a four-, four or eight-week training program where we be able to get them some tickets and some qualifications, get them four to eight weeks' work with us to get them a skill set and find out exactly where they want to end up or what they want to be and work with them and then get them employable. So when they come into the workforce, they have their tickets, they have forklift licence, they have first aid, they have their white cards, you know. In the long term, that's where we really want to end up. And the sustainable housing, it's a modular housing, again, very popular overseas. It's um, fully off-grid, you know, you're using your wastewater turns into grey water, your batteries all into solar and it's just building these cool little off-grid plods that you can just 
pop anywhere and um, would like to look to modelling that into making affordable housing for the homeless as well. So essentially what you're trying to do there is build not only the homes but build a, a career path potentially for some of these people. So training them in, in skills that they may or may not already have or you know you might find that somebody's already got the skills to be a carpenter but just fallen off the radar for whatever reason. That's just absolutely unbelievable. I mean, when you look at this model and how this could apply, not only just in South Australia, but in other states and territories around Australia, but around the world as well. Mm. I think this is uh, just absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, what you're creating too, you know, it's sort of become like a, a lifestyle brand in some respects, hasn't it? Because if you take a look at the implications of eating in a sustainable way and then the impact that that then has on the environment. But if you were living in one of these homes and eating that way, like what kind of impact could a person actually have? Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, the world's our limit and it's mm. that, that minimalistic approach that I think we all need to sort of start taking on board a bit, you know, the, the smallest amount we can use and still live your normal lifestyle. You know, you don't have to make these huge changes, which I think a lot of people are scared of. Yeah, It's a like, oh, I can't go there because I'm going to have to change so much where mm. you slowly start adapting it and you're like, oh, well, it's not that takes 28 days to change habit. You know, myself, I was playing footy. I was, you know, I was eating schnitters every night. You know, I was eating tea, you know, I'd just because I didn't have the knowledge. And I started doing it and, yeah, one of my best mates went, um, he still is fully plant-based now and he was sort of a, he, he's a, a one of the blokes that sort of inspired us to do it. And mm. um, he was the same, we're both footy players, but as soon as we sort of started to, you know, get the understanding about it, you can realise what impacts you can have. And, again, it doesn't have to be, diet is just something, you know, we're, that's just what we've launched at the moment, the food truck. But, mm. you know, we've got, we're looking at a sustainable clothing range again too where, using sustainable materials and, you know, only using buying clothing when you need it, not buying cheap material clothing that lasts, you know, maybe one summer Mm -hmm. and you have to throw it out after three or four wears, you know, trying to get stuff that you can wear for your lifetime and, you know, Again, it's just little, little things like that. And you, then you then you delve into, you know, um, recycling and you keep cups and everything. We are becoming a lot more conscious, yeah. you know, very much so. I've seen the trend now that even through the food, the guys coming through, there's a lot more people conscious in the community about the environment. Mm. But it, we're still a long way to go, like. But, yeah, these little houses, you know, you could be, the wastewater could go into the grey water, which goes into watering the gardens, which then you go into picking, you go to making, and it goes back in. And it's just this lovely little circle. So mm. I guess that's sort of the idea. And even bringing these little gardens into the school scheme, canteens were the same thing. They're off grid canteens. The kids from the gardens pick it, they start using it into their school's recesses and lunches. They start getting their five and two fruit and veg. And through all this, we're creating a more sustainable future. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, tell us about the impact on you personally. I get that you know you've had to considerably change your your lifestyle, and it would be out of step with what you're building as a business if you had remained that way. But what sort of personal impact has it had since you've really you've switched to being this way? I mean, I'm I'm going to be honest that I when I first started, I mostly didn't do it the right way. I wasn't getting the right proteins. I wasn't, you know, I lost a lot of weight, and I, you know, it pr- mostly came back. And a lot of people going, "Well, you look sick." You know, yeah, and, right. and it's nearly like people wanting you to look a bit, you know, they're like, well, look what you're doing, you know, yeah. you're not getting your meat, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, so, you know, I almost sort of did get a bit crook and didn't do it properly because I wasn't eating my, you know, wasn't getting my nuts, my legumes in there. I wasn't getting the energy that I should have been. And, yeah, it can, if you don't do it right, I definitely recommend you've got to go to your GP, you know, if you want to start adopting it, even just little changes, if, you know, just to make sure you are getting everything you need. And then, yeah, but once you sort of do it and you realise, you know, you do your green smoothies in the morning and you just make sure you're eating plenty of nuts and, you know, yeah, yeah actually it, once you've changed it, it's not too hard. And, you know, mm. I'll, I'll still eat a little bit of meat at weddings and whatnot. I'm, you know, tasting Australia, people have been coming around with these lovely, you know, dishes that, you know, I'll still have a little delve in. I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not 100% perfect. But, yeah, it, it is. It's a way you can change your lifestyle pretty easy. And, yeah, it's just we just want to showcase how to do it and, it's not that hard, if, yeah. you know, it's actually not that hard. But it's quite funny because obviously a lot of my mates are footy players and, you know, but even that, a lot of the guys said, oh, yeah, we've been having a lot more plant-based meals. You know, we've been eating a couple of vegetarian meals. It's actually quite light. You, feel, you know, mm. it's actually quite light on the stomach. You have mm. to feel really good. You've got energy. You know, it's uh, quite funny. That sort of stigma is already starting to change a little bit. Still caught plenty of grief, don't get me wrong. But mm. um, it is just cool to sort of see some guys, mates out of the blue and be like, oh, yeah, you know, we actually have... 
three or four vegetarian meals a day or, you know, mm. I mean, a week. You do have to be onto it, though. You know, you, you yeah. do have to make sure if you get a bit lazy and you get pretty caught up at work, which I do, you know, you skip a few meals, you, you do lose a bit of energy. It's a bit of menu planning and you, you can be pretty right. Mm. Have you had any um, any hurdles along the way that you've had to overcome with this? Like obviously engaging with homeless in the first place might have been something that people would consider being very difficult, but because of your history that seems to have been something that's really good. But is there any hurdles that you've, you've had to overcome? A fair few hurdles with – actually here our business model is we're going to start a vegan food truck in the Brossa Valley where most of our profits are going to go back to feeding the homeless and all our employees are going, we're going to try to hire the homeless as all the employees. You tell that to business advisors and they just go, well, you're going to fail in the first three months. <laughs> you know, it's not a, yeah. it's, it, it is not a successful business model. Mm. And don't get me wrong, we've had some pretty, you know, it's pushed me and Westy a lot of times where we're at a music festival, we're next to a beef burger place. They've got a line up for, you know, you can't see the end of it and we've got four people going through. Mm-hmm. You know, the hurdles of actually hitting the right crowds. We do bro- a lot of the brosser crowds we struggle with, mm-hmm. but hot tub wine machine at McLaren Vale, that seems to be a great demographic for us. It's like we do smoky red bean nachos, we do like organic lentil dals, we do like pulled jackfruit sliders. It's just a bit lighter. So that demo there, we can match it. But we still find, just with the, the culture we've got at the moment, the big hurdle is we'll go to an event and, you know, for us to break even is very hard because we are doing organic foods as well. So mm-hmm. us to plate something up is very pricey. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we're most probably, I'd say, you know, we've got unskilled labour in there as well. So we're nearly going for two to one. Mm. Um, so there'll be me, one of our managers, you know, maybe one of the clients, you know, we, we've still got to sort of train them up a bit and yeah. And the hurdle, I guess too, with the homeless side is at the start, I mostly wanted to try and help everybody, you know, I yeah. mostly opened it up to a bit too big. So, so far we've hired 25 clients right? and with the ne- the new model we're working with now, it's mostly just working on one or two mm-hmm. youth homelessness too, is a big thing that we want to focus towards. So not just being that Band-Aid fix, actually helping someone that both parents might be in jail or that's the only lifestyle they've sort of been brought up with. But we can actually give them that opportunity to break that cycle and then give them the opportunity to get some proper skills. Ideally, we'd love to actually build houses with them and let them, you know, get them into the community with a small house, a small garden, a successful job, they're back into the community and then that cycle's broken. Mm, You know, then they have kids and then you hear a lot of bad stuff about the Hutt Street Centre and, you know, people there, and it shits me a bit because the businesses are all whinging about it, but I don't know if any of them have actually ever thought of how can they help contribute, mm. you know, maybe start looking at hiring some homeless or working because, yes, there will be drugs, there will be alcohol, there will be violence, and it's a sad fact of it, but if we can start working with the youth homelessness to break that cycle then, mm. you know, then hopefully in the long term the homelessness side will slowly start to disappear. Mm. What I can really hear in what you're saying is that, you know, your commitment to the community and to people is, is there first and foremost and, you know, the business is is probably behind that. I can really see how, you know, this is a long game, isn't it? You know, the, the, you're looking to find where your market exists in the current environment, meanwhile looking to, you know, fundamentally change the way people operate so it creates a market for your business by teaching kids at a young age. If they come up that way, then it could be likely that in however many years' time, forage supply companies' food truck will be the one with a long line. Meanwhile, you know the one selling the beef patties are going. What just happened to my market? Mm. So there's something about what I really admire is that you're you having to create everything, not only a business but the market, and that's not having you stopped. And we, you know we speak to innovators of all kinds here. What I love is that you are really are genuinely innovating at every level and as part of that is kind of what you could call social innovation i mean you're you're literally changing the way people think and instead of looking at an existing market you know you're creating something from nothing because of the vision that you have and the implications that it has for business the environment and people is really admirable Uh, scott rogash from forage supply company thanks so much for joining us on the in show thank you very much for having me guys find out more at foragesupply.co Next week on The In Show. We'll have more from the world of innovation and Claire will have some incredible ideas being developed from all corners of the globe. And you can subscribe to The In Show at oscastnetwork.com. Hit the subscribe button to choose your preferred platform and rate us five stars if you like. Share an innovation you're working on at theinshow.online and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. 
Well, another inspirational show again this week. Um, I just can't believe these people are working so hard to help us. Yeah, they really are. It's just, you know, as we're seeing, innovation has got so much to do with people. It really does. And, like, speaking of that, Troy, you know, Janine Malcolm from TechFugees, she, she came in and talked about how she's helping refugees and, and building technology solutions for, for people that are trying to migrate into countries. But she's going to talk about innovation as an invitation for people to collaborate and how diversity plays an important role in that. If I can kind of give you my definition of innovation, I don't think it's about tech. I've always thought it's about people, it's more of an invitation for people to come together and use their diversity of lived experience and skills to kind of problem solve something that they're both or everyone's kind of commonly passionate about. So that's Mm. where the innovation spark kind of happens. You know, I see what Work Business SA are doing and I understand that, you know, one in three small businesses are run by someone from a migrant background. So how do we make those connections and how do we get that pipeline of entrepreneurs coming through and accessing all the amazing resources that we already have? And I think South Australia stands to benefit a lot. The In Show, presented by David Grice and Troy Sincock. News by Shannon Corvo and Claire Murphy. Music by Zach Grice. Produced by Jason Walker. Subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. A Dave and the Beanstalk production. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.